We have a full house. I'm not sure if there are any empty chairs, which is lovely. I want to welcome you all here this morning. Oh, there's a few in the back. Okay, thank you. I'm Joanne Britton. Joanne Bunge is not here today, so I will try to fill in for her. Um, one of the first things I want to do is remind you to silence your cell phones, please, and turn on your tea coil, if that helps you. The other announcement, most of you have signed the thank you card that Nisha made for Jean, our cookie baker, but if in, fa if in case you haven't yet signed it, would you do that at break time for us, please? Is that the table out there? So without further delay and ado, I want to introduce to you our speaker, who doesn't need any introduction, you all know, Professor George Drake, who is speaking to us today on Joe Rosenfield and Grinnell College. George? Well, thank you very much, Joanne. Um, it's nice to be here again. Uh, it's always nice to be here, <laughs> good friends and neighbors and so on. I was just talking with a group back there who, who just informed me they've changed their name into the Jewels of the Prairie. They're, they're a group of, was it 62 or 62 graduates, Dorothy Palmer's class at the college. Some of them, not all, fortunately, but some of them were subjected to me the very first time I taught a college course. <laughs> so, uh, I was here as a sabbatical replacement in 1661, so I got to know them, as I said, as kids, but I was a kid as well. And uh, they, uh, they, they are very loyal Grinnellians, and as a group, they come back here and gather, and they, uh, you know, <laughs> came today to, to, this, to this event. Um, I also, you remember J.R. would change his color according to whether it was the white snake or the black snake. I'm not doing that, but I'm wearing my cups tie today. Uh, in honor of Joe and parenthetically myself, I guess. Uh, uh, as we remember from last time, Joe had 274 shares of cup stock and was the chief minority stockholder of the Chicago Cubs for a, num a number of years. Now, uh, just to position ourselves as to where we've been and where, where we're going, last time I talked about Joe and his family, his family and pat with particular focus on the retail store, Yonkers, uh, department stores that uh, Joe's family owned, were half owners of Yonkers, and Joe uh, spent a, a significant portion of his career as a Yonkers executive and chairman of the board of Yonkers, and we talked about the particular things that Joe did for Yonkers. Uh, today, we'll focus on Joe. Now we're getting into Joe and Grinnell College. And I, I need to say that it will be as much about the college as it is about Joe. Uh, but the two go together very, very nicely. And I think in, the, in, in this room, there's probably an equal interest in Grinnell College, I hope. Uh, as there is with Joe Rosenfield. So that's the focus today. Next time, ne next Wednesday, uh, I will talk about Joe's years as a trustee beginning in late November of 1941, as I said, just a few days before Pearl Harbor when he began, and ending with his death in the year 2000. So 59 years as a trustee. And, and parenthetically, I can say the trustees have changed their arrangements now. It would be impossible for anyone to serve that long. There's a, a, a movement in and out. Joe became a life trustee fairly early in, in his, 50, you know, 20 years into his 59 years. The only thing life trustees could not do was vote on the addition of new trustees. Well, Joe would usually decide who should be the new trustee, and then he didn't have to vote on it. But they, in every other way, they were fully uh, participating in the board. But the board has stopped that practice. And I can tell you, they never would have done that while Joe was alive. And no one, no one would lose Joe's uh, involvement in the board. Now, I have a few loose ends to pick up from last time, and then we'll get going with Joe as a student. Several of you asked for a little bit more information about Joe's, Joe as a Jew. Jewish heritage. And that is particularly relevant for what I'm going to say today. Because my sense 
from talking to him, and he was never very explicit about this, but from knowing him and learning more about the college that he attended in the 1920s, there were probably very, very few colleges in America where a Jewish student would feel comfortable. And I think Grinnell College was one of those colleges. And that was absolutely critical. Joe was not a practicing Jew. He did support Jewish causes, and he supported the temple. In, uh, it was a steady contributor to the temple in Des Moines, but he was in, in no sense of the word an observant Jew, but he was a Jew. And uh, they had fraternities and sororities in West High School, uh, when he was in high school, and clearly the absence of fraternities and sororities at Cornell was a major factor partly in his decision to come to Grinnell and also in the experience that he uh, had. And then I, I think I mentioned last time, but it's worth emphasizing, that the college had literary societies in those days, which were the old, I'd say the closest thing to a fraternity or a sorority. Students were elected to them, uh, and we'll talk today about the attack on the, on the literary societies as, as being neither literary nor social, but they were an honor to be elected. And Joe was elected to Christomatia, which was the oldest of the societies, which began in Davenport before the college moved to Grinnell. He was elected in his freshman year, in his first year. Quite extraordinary, I think, for a Jewish student, and pretty indi an indication that at least that element of his background was irrelevant to that election process. Probably the fact that he was from a wealthy and uh, well-known Des Moines family didn't hurt him. And so he, was, he came to Grinnell with some social standing, for sure. Uh, and uh, anyway, so uh, that will come up off and on in, in what I have to say. The, there was uh, also, one or two of you said, what about those photos in the first handout? And I will, uh, if you happen to have it with you, uh, the, the, I will say something about them. It, it's pretty clear what that first page is. Joe Rosenfield through life. I did not plague you with the baby picture, but there is one. But Joe, as a, as a young man, he was he was a Boy Scout, uh, and apparently met Teddy Roosevelt uh, because of his presence in Des Moines as a prominent Boy Scout. I suspect this is about high school graduation, uh, the second photo. The third photo uh, here is Joe when he was with young comes from Yonkers material. Probably about, uh, maybe he would by this time would have been a Grinnell trustee, I think. The rather small image of Joe here is the Joe I really remember uh, from the 1980s. And then finally, in the last two or three years of Joe's life, he was bound to a wheelchair. And so that, that's Joe in, in his 90s. Then the photo, this photo, is the uh, s and staff. <laughs> and uh, Joe's right there in front. And then over to his right is the editor, Hilda Mock. I'm going to talk about her today. She was an extraordinary student in person. And uh, he, she, she beat him out for the editor. He wanted to be the editor, but she, she wasn't that bad. And then the next page is Joe's junior year, some spoof biographies of the editor and business manager of the Balteser, the, the college. Human magazine. I will talk about the ball teaser today. And then, pretty obviously, at the end, Joe and his, his wife, Danny, and his son, who died in an auto accident in 1962. So, that, those are the photos. Um, I also, I, I, I don't want to spend very much time on this, but I, I, one, there was one thing on my outline that I, I, I was so proud of myself at the end when I, when it was time for questions. And, uh, well, one of the reasons was I skipped this uh, particular item, and I, I might, for that reason, I it could take a little time, and I won't say very much about it, but it's the Heritage Communication Connection. One of those business organizations that Joe had a lot to do with. Uh, Jim County and his friend, Jim Hope, who'd been high school friends, they were both student council presidents and part of the Des Moines, so assembled student council presidents, they had some sort of assemblies, and got to know each other, and decided to go into business together, and the business they chose was cable television. 
They were in their 20s. Joe, one of, the, one of the businesses Joe understood pretty well was communications. And so they, that, this is the story that I think I told last time of the pitch that Jim Hope made to Joe when he was with Yonkers. It was for Yonkers investment in this case. It wasn't Joe's money at the time. When Joe had his head down the whole time during the presentation. And then uh, at the end, Bill Freeman, who was with him, said, well, Joe, what do you think? And Joe says, take all you can get. <laughs> um, and so Yonkers was an early investor in Heritage, and they had a terrible time uh, early on. Imagine cable, th think of the capital investment, laying all that cable. But also there wasn't enough program uh, to really make cable go in these early days. But eventually it did, so it became a flourishing business, and it became the sixth largest cable operator in the United States. They had. Texas, Kansas, and so on. They, were, they acquired cable networks in various places. But at the low point, when their stock had dropped below one dollar, <laughs> it was something like 80 cents for the stock, Joe bought a ton of it. He saved them. He, of course, later sold them for $34 a share. <laughs> but so it was a good thing for Joe, but they, they feel they, they would not have made it without Joe stepping in at the critical moment when they were just about to go under <coughs> and save it. So that was, and this is why Jim County is, is sponsoring this and paying for the direct costs of, of it. As Jim said, I hope it's not going to be six figures. Well, it isn't close to six figures, so I think he's going to come out okay. Now, you, ha you have a new handout, and I want to say, a little bit about that, then we'll get into it in some detail later. But um, again, in response to a request, I, I've given you a couple of bibliographical uh, items. One, one is uh, Louise Downs' autobiography, and the other is, is this little book, uh, which I think I picked up at the gift shop at the uh, Botanical Gardens in the morning. It's just, it's just come out, but it's a, it's a nice little business story of, of Yonkers. So if you ever are interested in exploring Yonkers for in about 100, 120 pages or so, this book is it's well worth reading. It's well done. Otherwise, what you have here are some, is some of Joe's humor. And we'll get into it. Uh, and it, mo most of it is from Doric, a column of pure beauty in the s and uh, Another the middle section is actually a review of the Malteser Follies, which Malteser every year would put on a, a show, the Follies, and a skit that Joe Rosenfeld and his good friend Bob Fell. Those of you who are from my era remember Roberta Fell, that's, that's her father, um, and who was Joe's closest friend at, at Grinnell. Uh, we, have, we had a fell house for a while, that was Joe really, it was where the student affairs were and Joe had made sure there was something on campus to honor his friend Bob. So we'll get, we'll get into these uh, as we go along today. So now, um, and I, with a slight apology, I'm working, some of this is working off of my manuscript, my book manuscript, so, um, which as I said, Judy's intimately <laughs> familiar with and this had a lot to do with. Um, as the editor, but um, in 1990, uh, Joe Wall and I interviewed uh, Joe Rosenfield for a video, and some of these quotes come from that, that video. Uh, Joe Wall and I asked uh, Joe Rosenfield, and I'll just say we, uh, so don't not get mixed up with the Joes here, uh, why he chose Grinnell, and here's what Joe said. Well, I'm not sure I picked it. I guess I probably did in the end. Getting out of high school, I really didn't know what I wanted, where I wanted to go to college. I was pretty immature. I know I didn't want to go east. I know that. I gave a little thought to the University of Iowa and some thought to Grinnell. And I think my mother knew I was going to Grinnell. Here we are, Rose. Uh, Joe, you're going to go to Grinnell. Um, and probably with my father, too. Maybe I did, too. But I passed on the University of Iowa, which I'm glad I did, although I went there later and took law. I entered Grinnell in the fall of 1921, not knowing exactly what I'd find down there, but after I'd been there about three weeks, I'd fallen in love with the place and you couldn't have driven me out of there with a team of horses. 
I just took the Grinnell right away. Whether Grinnell took to me, I don't know. Uh, and so then we followed up with a question of, well, what was it, what there was there about you, this institution that caused you to fall in love with it? And Joe said, oh, the whole spirit of the institution, partially the quality of the instruction, but the dormitory system. And I'm going to pause here for a moment. One of the most brilliant things ever done at Grinnell College, and it was in the main, in the main administration, was to build those dorms, the, east, the, the south campus and the north campus dorms. Those are the ones. They, they physically outline the campus, and they are, in my view, the iconic structures on campus. But to have decided to create houses for 45, 50 students that would involve you in a relatively small community, living community, and then to make those dorms a, a really centerpiece of the college experience and to work at it, and the college does work at it. I think that, that to me, and this is where I really resonate with Joe, to me that was the iconic experience of, of being at the college. Of course, in the days when some of us in the room were there, the men lived in the same dorms for four years. We had hall pins, we had initiation, we got paddled every Monday night, uh, and there was a fraternity-like atmosphere too. I, I was like Joe, I would not have gone to a school with fraternities or sororities, but I ended up in a somewhat fraternity-like atmosphere. And I liked it. Uh, but everyone was in and you got in the dorm because the dean put you there, and not because you were selected. So it was a democratic selection process. Okay. The lack of fraternities and sororities, says Joe, and the kind of people you found there, and the rather liberal atmosphere, the whole thing, some of it quite tangible, but I just liked it. And then asked to describe the school, he said it was a good school, but they had no money to go out and hire faculty. They could teach, most of them, they'd been there for quite a while. They didn't expect a raise from year to year because the college didn't have any money. We could not have been considered one of the best liberal arts colleges in the country in 1921. Today we are. That's the difference. But it was a good school. It was the best school in Iowa. It had a good reputation. Um, and if, what was your fondest memory of Grinnell? And Joe said, my fondest memory of Grinnell, probably the people I met down there. And I want to stop there. I, you, if you ask students what's the best thing about the college, they'll often say the people they meet. They're friends. But, I mean, here are those friends back there from 1962. They still get together annually. Uh, they stopped off at our cabin in Colorado. So, and, um, that happens. Our, our daughter, Melanie, a 92 graduate, has a group of eight or ten people. They're constantly in contact with each other. It, it's a community. And that obviously Joe found there. Um, all of them became friends of mine, all very liberal in their thinking, the kind of people that I like. That, I think, is the first remembrance I have. The atmosphere of the college, clearly the, the college respected the student body. I was very happy there for four years. So there's some of Joe's own testimony about his, his collegiate years. He was a political science major and a history minor, I'm glad to say. Um, he, when asked about the faculty, he could remember and comment on two or three really good teachers he had, but he, his general impression was that it was okay, but not great. And uh, I still have to get permission, even, even if someone has gone as long as Joe, you have to get permission to look at someone's transcript, and I haven't gotten that yet. I have to get a relative to give me permission. Uh, but I'm, I'm guessing what I'm going to see is a lot of Bs. Good, you know, good. Joe, Joe was brilliant, but he didn't, I don't think he worked very hard uh, academically when he was there. And when you sort of talk about the things he did, you'll see there wasn't a whole lot of time left over for study. He became a very good student at Iowa Law. And there he really hit the books, and, and uh, his intelligence as a student uh, came through. How big was Grinnell in 1921? There were the college was divided between the Liberal Arts College and the School of Music. Now that makes, that, yeah, School of Music. Uh, that makes it sound really, you know, Grinnell with the Music Conservatory. Well, it wasn't quite that. It was good. 
But it was created back in the 19th century because the thought was that women really couldn't do the liberal arts curriculum. <laughs> it was ma mathematics and Latin, the Greek and Latin and so on, and surely women, that's too much for the women. So let's get, have a school of music where they can learn useful skills and so on. Uh, so there, wa there were roughly 100 or so students in the school, in the school of music and it existed in Joe's time. So uh, the total student body was 880 and of those 776 were in the Liberal Arts College and 21 saw a kind of rise in uh, attendance in, in students and it actually gradually dropped uh, during Joe's time. And there would be um, a huge attrition. Joe was in a class of around 400 coming in and 170 some graduates. So pretty, pretty substantial uh, attrition. But you know, could you afford to stay? There weren't a lot of scholarships and that sort of thing. So there were a lot of issues that would made it hard, hard to stay in, in college. The students came from North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, Minnesota, Illinois, Nebraska, Wyoming, Montana, Missouri, California, Pennsylvania, and Ohio. So a pretty good uh, spread over the Midwest and a little bit of, of California. But it was definitely a Midwestern school and definitely an Iowa, Iowa school. Um, the admission, they didn't have an admissions office. They, did, they didn't have an admissions office until the 19, uh, until the Stevens era. And then it was called uh, publicity. Uh, I mean, today, you know, just imagine Nancy, a college trying to function without admission office. How did they get students? Congregational pastors were a huge source. And they had the Gates lecture then as now, and they would invite every, invite every single congregational pastor in the state to come to Grinnell for the Gates lectures, and a lot of them came. So they would, you know, that connection with the place, actually come to campus for two or three days, about half a week, you know, and, and vibe of the atmosphere of Grinnell College. And the other great source were school teachers, graduates of Grinnell. And Grinnell was producing a lot of school teachers in those days. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure faculty and others uh, made efforts uh, to uh, contact potential students and so on, but those two sources were, were the basic ones. The tuition, was, when Joe entered Grinnell, was $160. And the board and room, a lot more, $425. So, uh, they didn't, weren't paying the faculty very much. Uh, fees were 750 so a comprehensive fee of just a little under $600. Now, of course, those are 1920s dollars, so they're a lot more valuable than today's dollars, but the, I hesitate to say out loud what the comprehensive fee of Grinnell is, but it's too pushing $60,000. Now, an awful lot of that goes right out the window or the door in the form of financial aid. Now, half, uh, I mean, 90% of Grinnell students are on aid, and a, a lot of them, I'd say somewhere between 15 to 20% of Grinnell students, if they had to pay and their families had to pay, could go to a community college, that's it. So there, Grinnell had, is more accessible, actually. Uh, we've got the statistics to prove it's the most accessible of the elite liberal arts colleges in America in terms of what students have to pay. But it, it's, you know, you set that fee and then you start uh, whittling away at, with, with money that doesn't come in through scholarships. Um, there were 60 faculty, 18 uh, in, the, in the liberal arts college, 18 in the School of Music. And this is, this will get, particularly my faculty colleagues here, there were 12 administrators. <laughs> And six, six and a half in the library, that's, that's pretty decent, uh, <coughs> library staff. But only 12 administrators. If you think of someone like Louis Phelps, who was the treasurer, head of buildings and grounds, and secretary of the college, and he had one secretary, period. He didn't know. So they ran the college virtually on a shoestring. But as Joe said, they didn't have any money. You have to have a faculty, you have to have buildings, and so on. So there wasn't a lot left over to pay for administrators. But uh, uh, I, I don't know what the ratio today is, but there's more definitely more administration and staff than there are, are faculty today. The religious affiliation of students, 
uh, 279 were Congregationalists. A lot. I mean, that's, that's large. Uh, 197 Methodists, 89 Presbyterians. This is from 1922-23 statistics. 28 Baptists, 29 Disciples of Christ, 23 Episcopalians, 10 Christian Science, 7 Catholics. There are probably more Catholics at Grinnell than any other group today. Uh, at least when I was president, they were about 25 or 30 percent of the student body. Six Lutherans, six Jewish students, among whom was Joe, three Reformed, and then 50 that indicated no affiliation. Now, if you were to ask the same question today, uh, you would get a majority, I think, who have no, would indicate no religious affiliation. I'm just guessing there. I don't know that. And then what the students do after they graduate. Uh, in 1923, the, the statistics were 15% become teachers, 10% with other jobs in education. So there's 25% going into education. 9% um, in medicine, 9% banking, 7% in the ministry, Christian ministry, 5% journalism, 5% social and public service, and 3% engineering. An interesting contrast with today, but they, these are not apples and apple comparison, but I, I may have mentioned this publicly in this, in this room, I'm not sure, but I'll say it again. The only thing Grinnell has ever been rated number one in the nation for is in public service of its graduates. The Washington Monthly was about three or four years ago now, did it? You know, all these magazines are trying to sell, let's, let's do this rating, let's do this rating. So they rated institutions on what their graduates did in relation to public service. Now, public service is broadly defined. Teaching is public service in this, in this, well, in this particular survey. That's why this is not an apples and apples comparison. Now, the, actually, the real first were, were the service academies, uh, West Point, Annapolis, and so on. And about 85% of their graduates go into public service. You wonder what the other 15% are doing. They're not going into the service, uh, military service. But the first of the non-military academies was Grinnell, 42%. The next collegiate institution was 378 37.8 or something. By a considerable margin, Grinnell had, was graduating the most highest percentage of students going in, into public service. Uh, this is a sort of side to that comparison to today. <clears throat> they took a poll in 1923, it seemed like the S&D was really on to polls that year, of the favorite literature of the faculty. <laughs> 17 chose Shakespeare, 16 the Bible. I'd like to take that poll today. <laughs> uh, five H.G. Wells' Outline of History, five the Dialogues of Plato, Four, sick, Goethe's Faust. Uh, three, Dante's Divine Comedy, and three, Browning Poetry. So, interesting to see where the intellectual interests of the faculty were. There was pretty, a pretty good um, uh, presence of what you call high culture on the campus. Both the Minneapolis and St. Louis symphonies played in Herrick Chapel. Pablo Casals, played, this is all during Joe's time in school, Pablo was a, Emil Telemann, the Hungarian violinist, and so on. So they got, just as today, there were a few major events and, and headliners in, in cultural issues. This was the era of the 19th Amendment, 1920, for the first time women can vote. Among the things that Hilda Malk did was to get the college to provide newspapers and magazines in all of the cottage lounges. The South Campus were called cottages. So the women could become informed citizens and be good, good, good electors. Uh, 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 so I mean, this, this was very much in the atmosphere of the time. Uh, and it, you could see, you see, the women are really sort of thrust at Grinnell in, in those days. And you see them sort of pushing themselves forward to uh, occupy a new position, such as editor of the s &B, uh, and doing something with that, with that position. Um, Hallie Flanagan was on the faculty, graduate of Grinnell High School, graduate of Grinnell College, and uh, ran the Federal Arts and Writers Program under, under Roosevelt, uh, due to her 
a friend, Harry Hopkins. The, Joe's senior year, they did a production of Romeo and Juliet, which just had the, stunned the campus. And in fact, the head of the uh, Carnegie Foundation happened to see that production. He was on campus, and Grinnell got a big grant from Carnegie right after that. So <laughs> he, was, he was enormously impressed. She, she didn't remain at Grinnell beyond this particular period. She ended up at Vassar, but before that she got a Guggenheim Fellowship. Did that for a year and then, then ended up at Vassar. James Norman Hall, yes. graduate from the teens, uh, author of Mutiny on the Bounty, was co-author of Mutiny on the Bounty, and a member of the Lafayette Escadrille during World War I, flying for the French against the Germans in World War I, was, came back to visit campus. And uh, I guess I'll, I'll quote, what, it's, it's kind of an interesting quote, uh, what, what he had to say. Um, he said, he was interviewed by the SMB, and he says, uh, under the headline, found a Grinnell alumnus who hates Western civilization, abominates evangelical missionaries, and detests radio. <laughs> and uh, he was leaving, it, I was living in Tahiti at this point, and he, he kind of said, Hall says, um, let's see, I wouldn't own one, he's talking about a radio, I wouldn't own, own one if they were perfect, I hate them. Just another mark of Western industrial machine made soul to civilization. And then about missionaries said, they've done nothing but harm. The Navy would be a thousand times better if they had never come. They were living simply and naturally when the missionaries came. But the missionaries told it was wicked for a woman to have more than one husband. Monogamy was instituted. There was a preponderance of unmarried men and inevitable results followed. The missionaries may have done some good in putting down cannibalism, but they have done immeasurable harm. Before the appearance of Westerners, disease was unknown in the island. I wonder about that. Now with the inroads of Western civilization, Western society, and Western morality, disease and sickness has wiped out the main portion of the natives, and the few that are left are sickly and diseased with uh, Why do we have to think that what's good for us is good for everybody else too? How would we like it if the Buddhists and the Confucianists and the Mohammedans and the rest of the Orientals would come over here trying to force their religion and customs and civilization on us? They have as much right to do that as we have to go over there, yet we'd make a mighty big fuss were they to try it. So, so much for James Norman Hall. Um, they had a men's glee club, for those of us who are singers which was first in the West. They would have a, a glee club co co contest at Orchestra Hall in Chicago. Wow. And, they, and, and in the, uh, year, in this, um, it's 1924, the, in the contest, they won first place. And for the first time, the Eastern contest invited the Western winner. Only once, because Grinnell did so well, that they didn't invite the West back, but Grinnell, Yale won, and Grinnell was fourth of a dozen or so schools. So I guess you would say they were fourth nationally. Uh, they, the, the, the Chicago one was all of the West was included there. It wasn't just, just the Midwest. So it was a powerful, powerful organization. I'm going to mention Morgan Taylor, the Olympian, in a minute. And Morgan Taylor was the first tenor in the uh, Glee Club, so this Sort of thing that we used to at Cornell, where the athletes do other things, and not, not just athletes. Um, Oxford and Cambridge debaters came to Cornell to debate the, the Cornell team. And uh, one of the debaters from Oxford was Malcolm McDonald, the son of the British Prime Minister Ramsay McDonald. So uh, these little things would, would pop up in the s &D. Uh, This was the time of Edward Steiner. We've got a Steiner Hall on campus. Tommy's nodding. Uh, so that's something that uh, their family was very interested in. Steiner wrote 26 books. By far the most prolific uh, writer on the Grinnell faculty. It takes up a shelf like this. And having read, I've now read maybe six or seven of them. I, am, I can understand how he could do it because he was doing research in immigration, and it was really field research. He would ride back and forth to Europe and steerage and interview folks. 
and then the results of those interviews would come out in various volumes. It most Interesting from my point of view is volume is, is, is his autobiography called From Alien to Citizen, where he describes his life, which was an extraordinary life. He, he emigrated to the U.S. in order to avoid being drafted into the Austrian army. His father had been killed in, 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 in 1866 in battle uh, in the Austrian army, and Stein was born posthumously. He never knew his father. He wasn't about to be drafted and go into the army. And so, as a late teenager, he emigrated to the U.S. He knew four or five European languages, he did not know English. And he had a typical uh, immigrant's experience, uh, starting with the uh, clothing trade in New York, in Brooklyn then migrating west, and it got into the steel industry in Pennsylvania, happened to be caught up in a strike, someone had loaned him a rusty pistol, he got arrested, ended up in jail for eight or nine months, moved on to Chicago, where he was mugged, uh, quite literally, looking at job, um, a job board, uh, he was standing on a uh, trap door, which plunged him down to the basement, then they mugged him. Kind of um, ended up finally working on Midwestern farms, and by that time his English was beginning to develop. And on a train with, that was taking cattle east, and he was in the caboose, so responsible for those cattle, uh, he got into an altercation and got tossed off the train in a place he calls in the autobiography Bethlehem. I think it was Oxford, Ohio. He stayed there lived with a congregational pastor and his wife, worked in a store as a clerk, because his English was good enough now, and converted from Judaism to Christianity, and went to Oberlin Seminary, which was where his pastor, uh, landlord, was from. He served in four different churches in the Midwest, and happened to meet uh, John Hanson Thomas Maine on a boat trip back to Europe. He was going over to interview Tolstoy because he's, he wrote a biography, one of his books is a biography of Tolstoy. And uh, Maine was much taken with him. They had lost George Heron as the uh, professor of applied Christianity, so Maine hired him out of his pastorate in Sandusky, Ohio, in 1903 to come to Grinnell as the uh, professor of applied Christianity. And so he then was a teacher and scholar doing this research, on, having been an immigrant, on the immigration experience. So he's one of the er, early great scholars of American immigration. Uh, it's difficult to see how much influence he had on students because he was sort of on the Chautauqua circuit a lot and uh, was away from campus giving speeches. Though, and and, and the, the main thing that shows up in the s &B is that the college had frequent chapters, certainly more than once a week, and he was frequently a, a chapel speaker. So um, I'm getting the sign here, so we'll stop here in just a minute. Um, so anyway, um, that was, he was probably the premier face of the faculty during Joe's time, and, and certainly an influence on students. So I'm going to I'm going to mention one other person. We'll take a break, and then I'll go on with with other folks. Um, I, I mentioned Louis Phelps, and I'll just uh, say one thing about Louis. He, uh, I don't know. Did anyone here know know ever know know him? Emily, but what what was your impression of of Louis? Uh, he was wonderful. He, when we came in 1948, uh, he was in charge of uh, housing for faculty. And uh, he was the person that sold us a house, a prefab, and um, and not only that, he was a neighbor because uh, it ended up uh, we ended up on Spring Street, and his house was on the corner of the Tenth and Spring. And we, Alice, and, and well, the whole family, we knew him very well. Well, and and what Emily said was that uh, Louis Phelps sold. John and Emily, their house, and uh, was also a na neighbor, and they knew him very well. What the, the 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 spirit in which Emily, with which Emily just spoke, is the spirit with which everyone 
mentioned Louis Phelps. I can't tell you how many during my time as president I would meet with graduates of the 20s and 30s, particularly the 30s, who would say, I don't know how I got through Grinnell. It was the Depression. Somehow Louis Phelps worked it out. <laughs> he would find them jobs or forego their, their tuition payments, still another, I mean, loans, that kind of thing. He just, he just knew how to get things done. And t t person after person said, I never would have made it through Grinnell College without Louis Phelps. Now, Louis was sort of in his heyday uh, when, when uh, Joe was there. He was a, a major figure on campus and a person that really this college needs to remember. So we'll, we'll take a, our, our break now and, and then continue. To hear more of this riveting lecture, <laughs> Professor Drake, it's all yours. Thank you, Joanne. Well, I'm, I'm going to try to speed up here a little bit uh, with this um, examination of the people that Joe encountered when he was in his college. Joe said that he never missed a sporting event and would sometimes go to practice. Um, and uh, two of the probably the most outstanding athletes that were at Grinnell during his time were both runners. A man named Leonard Palou, who was a Phi Beta Kappa chemistry student, graduated in 1922. He was a World War I veteran whose college years had been interrupted by the war. He was wounded by shrapnel during the war, lost an eye, and there was one thing I read which is clearly not true. Yet. One leg was supposed to be four inches shorter than the other, <laughs> but it was shorter than the other. But he was the leading sprinter in the United States. He was the national champion in the 100 and the 220 yard dash, tried out for the Olympics and he was beaten by Charlie Paddock in, in the trials, but uh, nearly made the, they made the Olympic team. Uh, the story is, and I guess it's true, that sometimes his glass eye would drop out during the race. <laughs> it wasn't, wasn't very well, very well fitted. Well, he graduated in 22, so he was a senior uh, during Joe's freshman year. The other one, he, would, he didn't know well, a, a 26, 1926 graduate, but he started in Joe's class. He started with the class in 1925. That was Morgan Taylor, who won the 400-meter hurdles at the Paris Olympics. If you've seen the movie Chariots of Fire, Lord Lindsay is worried about the American Taylor uh, as his rival. Uh, and, and so he, he, mentioned, he mentioned in that movie. It's a very interesting thing I could get, as a track guy, I could get way off going on this tonight. I've got to move quickly. But he ended up with five world records. Uh, Grinnell was known as the best little track school in the West. And in the, in the Missouri Valley Conference, which was Kansas University, Kansas State, Missouri, Iowa State, Oklahoma, Nebraska, Drake, and Washington University. So there were two colleges, Grinnell and Washington University, would think of as more like liberal arts colleges today, or otherwise major universities. And Grinnell was never worse than second or third in the conference track, track meet. They were, they were really strong track schools. And Taylor what, what ran the 220-yard dash, he ran the high hurdles, he ran the low hurdles, he ran the quarter mile. He was a high jumper. He could have been a, a great decathlon. He had never run the 400-meter hurdles. That was not a collegiate distance in those days. But he decided, since he was a quarter miler and a hurdler, he might be good at that. And so the first time he ran it, the race was in the Midwest uh, tri uh, preliminary trials for the Olympic team for 24. It was his junior year in college. And he was second to a runner from the University of Iowa. But then he qualified for the national uh, nationals uh, for qualification in Boston and won in world record time. And then he went on to win the Olympics. Uh, he ended up placing in three different Olympics. That, that's over 12 years. Uh, in uh, Amsterdam and in Los Angeles. He was, I think, third each of those times. He had a first, a third, and a third. So he's a medalist in three Olympics. At the time, the only American who had medaled in the same event for three different Olympics. So he was an extraordinary athlete. Uh, and uh, as I say, also tenor in the, uh, you know, 
fourth place national uh, glee club. So uh, a really extraordinary, the only Olympic champion Grinnell has ever had. So he was uh, essentially a classmate of, of Joe's. And then finally, across from his room in Langen Hall, Joe was in Langen, uh, was a person named Frank Cooper, who we know as Gary Cooper. Uh, and here's what Joe had to say about Cooper. Yes, he was uh, there for two years while I was there. He came to Grinnell as a freshman while I was a sophomore, but he was older. He had been out of school several years. He came to Grinnell from Montana because another fellow from Montana kind of thought, brought, kind of brought him there, who was already in school. Gary's father was a justice of the Montana Supreme Court. He wasn't known as Gary Cooper then, he was Frank Cooper, but called Cowboy Cooper. And the first year he was there, he lived across the hall from me, so I got to know him reasonably well. He was really kind of a recluse. He didn't circuit around, around too much, he did a lot of drawing, and I think he went to California to become a commercial artist, but somehow or other got a shot at film. And you know, he made quite a success of it. You didn't see a lot of him. He spent a lot of time in his room, and by the way, uh, the Wubbles and the Drakes just saw High Noon within the last 10 days or so. And that's kind of the character you get there, the sort of assertive, strong, resilient, self-contained person, but kind of shy. Uh, that's part of the allure of Gary Cooper, he sort of projected that shyness on the screen. He didn't have, as I determined, a lot of close friends, and I had kind of gathered that he didn't care an awful lot about the place. But curiously enough, about six or seven years ago, I was at a birthday party in New York for Warren Buffett's 50th birthday. And they called on me for a few remarks, and I put in a few plugs for Grinnell. That's typical of Joe, he always did that. And after dinner, a young woman, I don't know how young she was, 40 or 50 or something, <laughs> came up and introduced herself. She was Gary Cooper's daughter. And she told me how much her father had liked Grinnell. And her house was stacked full of memorabilia and pictures of the whole business about Grinnell College. And it was one of the loves of his life, which was quite a surprise to me. <laughs> and I want to t talk about two women. I've talked about, you know, women who are beginning to assert themselves, who were both classmates of Joe, class of 25, and really extraordinary women. Hilda Malk is one of them. I've already mentioned her. I'm gonna, going to uh, read to you something from her editorials her, uh, the, uh, attacking the literary societies. The literary societies ended in spring of 25. And Hilda Malk's SNB, and by, for those of you who don't know, as Scarlet Black School newspaper, uh, uh, editorials, uh, and I've just quoted a couple of things from her er, ed, editorials. Anything but literary, with only a thumble, thimbleful of social training. She charged them with being antiquated, rusty, outgrown, un undemocratic anachronisms whose days have come and gone. She added that the literary society meant more to those who were left out than to those who were included. Finally, she asked if Grinnell is supposed to be a democratic school, how does this depiction align with the literary society? And then, uh, in the very next issue of the SMB, her editorial was, let's strike while the iron is hot. And they did strike while the iron is hot, and the women's literary society disappeared. She began to work on the men's societies, but her editorial uh, tenure ran out, so she wasn't able to, to bring the men's down. And for, for those from our era, they were replaced by a thing called the Tanager Society, which would focus on singing or drama or diff different full styles. So there was something uh, that was created to replace that. The other person I want to mention is Marguerite Merriman, uh, who was from Blairsburg, Iowa. And she wrote for a new literary magazine on campus, The Hunter, a sketch called Blairsburg Sketches about folks in her hometown. She thought that the editor of the magazine, Professor Walser, would change the names of the people. <laughs> they, he didn't. So this uh, expose from her town appeared in this magazine 
naming names. Uh, and here's just an example, and this is the woman who brought a lawsuit uh, against the college over this issue, uh, Genevieve Bendorf Cable, who was the school superintendent. It was you who, of all the teachers in Hamilton County, ranked highest in the intelligence tests. You, the principal of Blairsburg High School, the one who did more in one hour than other teachers did in three. Efficient, enterprising, <coughs> alert. It was you who talked to the high school girls about rolled hoes. At Christmas time, you sent out announcements of your marriage to Harry Cable, the drafted ex-hero who was waiting for his bonus. And you bought yourself a wedding ring and went on teaching while the students gambled as to whether it would be a boy or a girl. <laughs> Harry Jr. was born the week after commencement, and the next week you bought a cream station wagon for Harry, and you worked down there. A cream station, not a station wagon, a creamery station. Five months at this time, it was the farmers who were gambling as to whether it would be a boy or a girl. They had every day of four months to gamble, because you were much around town. You were writing items for the Webster City Daily News, so you met all the trains. But you had told the girls not to roll their hoes, and you had passed a high intelligence test. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> no wonder there was a lawsuit. And, and Walser lost his job. He was fired. And uh, Marguerite went underground, but she did graduate, and she became a school teacher. And I, I met her once. Uh, and she was a five band cap, but very prominently featured in the S S and G story. But, Quite, I mean, it, this is really pretty, pretty good, <laughs> if, if you didn't name names. Uh, and, and Joe Rosenfield, typical, typically put in Doric, uh, a profile of Marguerite. Name, Marguerite Mer Merriman. Hometown Blairsburg. Hobby, sketches. Favorite song, there'll be a hot time in the old town. <laughs> Favorite breakfast food, wild oats. <laughs> Favorite magazine, Hunto. Club, sketch club, Blairsburg chapter, PYA, I'm not sure what that is. Degree, third. <laughs> okay, so I've, I've mentioned Doric, and, and let's, let's get into Doric. Uh, so, as I've said before, Joe is a wonderful subject as a student, because most students, uh, any one of us in the room, graduates of Grinnell, if you went, if they went back, and tried to find, write, write about us. Uh, it'd be pretty hard to find us. But Joe was easy to find because he was involved in, in publications. And so, uh, since he, he and, and Bob Fell did this column that appeared not in every single issue of the SMB, the, the school newspaper came out twice a week in those days and was a, a, a pretty uh, major uh, enterprise. But, um, I'm, I'm not, the first paragraph is just something I've already quoted about why Joe chose for you now, but here's, here are, uh, he, he was a running joke, the, the girl in my English class. Now, uh, the misogyny of what of this stuff is going to get to you. <laughs> Joe was a feminist, I mean, after all, in support of Planned Parenthood and so on, but he was a typical undergraduate and went with the flow for the kind of jokes that people told in those days. Here we are, the girl in my English class. The girl in my English class said that she is glad Grinnell isn't mixed up in politics the way that horrid electoral college is. <laughs> the girl in my English class says that she reads in the paper that it took 34,000 muskrats to make the Hudson Seal coats worn last year. And she thinks it is wonderful how those dear little animals can be taught to do such <laughs> I'm another one, the girl in my English class says she is so interested in the foreign exchange and that she got so excited when the mark and the frank went down and she wishes she could find the exchange rate of the last report. <laughs> now this, the, the next one is actually, in a way, cleverer. I mean, I'm sure they picked up these jokes around and I doubt they made all of them up. But um, it's about the women of Quad, in other words, South Campus. Have been agitated, uh, to respond to these jibes. And so, Doric says, yesterday some bobbed-haired Betty asked why the column seemed to ignore the inmates of the quadrangle. <laughs> we lifted our collective hat, see etiquette of gentlemen and college students, pages 437 to 437 included, 
and answered, if that is so, we are sorry, but not so sorry that our mind's eye is obscured by tears. To be frank, you women are more interesting objectively than you, and otherwise. You are like the moon that is more beautiful and alluring when it is near the horizon and slightly obscured by bending poplars and scudding clouds. It loses much of its mystery and charm when it aspires to the void of mid-heaven. So should you stay by the poplars of enchanting silence and avoid the cold void of the printed work. However, if any quad, and the quad feels that she or her has anything of worth, she should submit her brainchild to us, secure in the knowledge that we will treat it as our own. The above proposal is subject to veto by Plato, the linotype operator. Uh, here's you know, more, I mean, the women thing really goes on. More about women. Aristotle, our demon press feeder, says women are like secondhand clothes. They always hang around. <laughs> or if Noah had realized that he was saving a race that in the future years would produce that which is known by the name of Cohen, he would have scuttled the ark. <laughs> That's the one that gets more flirtations. We always thought that co-eds as a class were barnacles on the ship of progress, until last week when one of them tried to play footy-footy with us at the library. And then there was an announcement, Messrs. Rosenfield, Pierce, and Norris, John Norris, uh, also a later board member, wish to announce to the quadrangle that they will be out of town on Saturday. So unav unavailable. Saturday. Then, uh, the last Doric of the year, supposedly. In fact, there were going to be three more. But th this is the way they kick it off. The crumbling column. As we sit here in our room, watching the last sanguine glow of the setting sun, with all the mysteries of crepuscular shadows about us, we are sad, discouraged, despondent, just a little, depressed, a trifle. This is the last Doric our last line, born of good intentions and expiring as a broken body. Our best intentions have been misconstrued. At every turn we have been called malicious. Like a bowl of soup, we came in hot and were carried out cold. And then uh, the next one is we appear again. The cold soup has been taken to the kitchen and warmed over. So it goes on for about uh, another month of, of, of closing columns. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go, get into this next one, which is, is Maul Teaser, um, and then we'll go back what, to a, a few more uh, things from Doric. It's, but since we have this before us, um, this is a review of the, of the skit that Joe and um, Bob Fell did for the, for the Maul Teaser Follies. And it's, it's, the quote starts about the middle of that paragraph. Skeletons of Yesterday by Fell and Rosenfield a sketch of ribald horseplay at the expense of the faculty, which somehow mangled, m managed to press past the board of censors, scored a distinct hit with the audience. In common with two other original skits, it reflected the attitude of the smart child who shows off his acquired profanity, sophistication, and voice before company, secure in the knowledge that mother cannot spank. <laughs> Well, the S&B is really interesting. I, I, I'm not sure that it reaches that quality today. It was really, a, a, I thought, a very interesting. I mean, I did not uh, think of it owners plowing through all the s and B for Joe's, Joe's time at the college. Then the, the last things here are more uh, pranks, and, and so I won't, I'm going to use there. You can read it. But I just ask you to turn to the last page. Uh, Joe was the business manager for the cycle. And uh, you see, the juniors produced the cyclone. And so they labeled the cyclone, this is very confusing, they labeled the cyclone with their class here, it's 25, but it actually comes out in 24. So the 19, if you get into the, to the archives and look for the 1925 cyclone, it's actually produced in 1924, but by the class of 1925. So it's given the year designation of the class that produced it, not the class that's graduated. And so Joe, at the end of that cyclone, when he was a business manager, put in this uh, account. Uh, for example, liabilities, uh, over $1,100 for the butler, office boys, and stenographers. Uh, 200, down away, $200 for the staff men after the great game. Uh, $2,600 for staff banquets. 
uh, and endowment fund for pensions for the for the uh, is sixteen thousand five hundred twenty-three dollars. But then you get to the production cost, twenty-six dollars for engraving. The printing is thirteen dollars and seventy-five cents. Binding the cyclone nine eighteen. So very little money according to this account for actually producing the cyclone, but lots of money for the perks for the staff. Or assets, <laughs> received for printing photos, $8,000, received for not printing photos, $19,000. <laughs> so, you know, Joe was known as Line of Day Rosenfield. When you, when you, when you see this, these things, you understand this is a very funny guy. And, Everyone comments on his humor. Um, the, uh, the great comment that mo people carry around with them and, uh, was when the, when the board had to confront finally the issue of co-ed dorms in the late 60s. It was coming, but it was, the board was really, really reluctant. The administration now said, yes, we've got to go this direction. So it was a very contentious board meeting and before they got to the vote in the discussion. Finally, Joe hadn't said much. Finally, Joe said, wow, I'm for it if they make it retroactive. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the, the meeting just broke up and they all voted for it. I mean, it, just, it was so typical of what Joe could, what Joe, Joe could do. <laughs> you know, hearing your laughter, it pleases me so much that Joe can still engender that kind of response from people. He, he did, and it was just, that was just Joe. So it, it's well, when we get to next week and the following week, it's more serious stuff. But, but this is Joe as an undergraduate, which, well, that humorous side of him really does come out. Um, I'm going to just read, see, yeah, we've got a little bit more time. I'm going to read a few more items from the Dory. Uh, and let's see, uh, okay, I, I'm going to get there just right now. Um, the Merchants National Bank, the Sullivan Bank, went bankrupt in spring of Joe's senior year, as did the savings bank in town. It was a, it was a bad time for banks. But Doric, of course, turned this into a lot of fun. Uh, on the banks of Old Grinnell, Aristotle, our daily reporter, brings news that Merchants National Bank opened yesterday to let three directors out the back door. <laughs> <laughs> and then after the uh, Grinnell Savings Bank had gone under, this one appeared, notice there will be a meeting of all the students who did not lose money in either the Merchants or Savings Bank. Said meeting to be held in the southeast corner of the reading room of ARA. So it was a very small little, little space. But also in the spring, uh, the city water supply was diminishing and virtually non existent. Uh, they, they, the recommendation was that our deep well south of town should be deepened. It didn't happen immediately, but, but ultimately it happened. But uh, here's one. The management of Arbor Lake wishes to announce that from now on, a charge of 50 cents will be levied for each mud bath taken. <laughs> or this one. The superintendent of buildings and grounds wished to announce that the all-college swimming pool, which has just been built, is at last completed and will be ready for occupation about June 1st. He advised students as well as faculty to pray for rain as last Saturday the city, city reservoir was drained. <laughs> And then, let's see, oh, endowment. The college in Joe's, Joe's senior year went into a major endowment campaign. And this is really interesting since Joe is most identified with building college endowment. But he had a lot of fun with the college effort when he was a student. Um, it had been announced in the SMB in October of 24 that a $650,000 endowment was uh, being undertaken. So $650,000. Here's the, the Doric column. A few suggestions. Plans now underway to raise $650,000 for the Grinnell Endowment. Here are a few suggestions as to how to raise the money. Get one man to give it up. <laughs> Get 650,000 lumps to give $1 a piece. Burn the science building, if it's insured. <laughs> Sell sandwiches. Do away with the professor's salaries for a period of three years. <laughs> Sell the chapel. 
and then uh, a week later, Bull College. It cost Mr. Duke, the Tobacco King, about six million dollars to get a school named after him. It will cost Mr. Durham just six hundred fifty thousand dollars to change the name of this school, and that is no bull. <laughs> oh, I, I guess I'll give you another one. The following letter was received from a former student in regard to the endowment cam campaign. Dear Mr. Phelps, we'd like to know if you are accepting soap wrappers and United Cigar coupons as a contribution to the campaign fund. Have saved enough to win a Buster Brown Flash. Would we'll be glad to sacrifice for old Cornell. Let me know. Alumnus. <laughs> Dear alumnus, yes, we will accept them. Yours thriftily, L.B. Phelps. <laughs> then uh, there was a thing called Flump Day. And uh, this is, you know, a, a spring uh, <coughs> abandon the campus kind of operation. <coughs> and this was another suggestion as to how college could make some money out of the flunk day. The college statistician, H.W. Matlack, after laboring with a blue pencil for 37 hours, has doped out that the all-college flunk day will net the college an enormous sum. Here is the reasoning. First, there will be great savings on meals with 800 students out of town missing three meals each, making a grand total of 2,400 meals if everyone had gotten up for breakfast. It will mean saving $12.08 less pie, which has already been purchased by Marty Ward. Secondly, there would be no hot water, which will net the college eight cents. <laughs> so they don't think they got much hot water on the college. No books will be stolen from the library. It will be closed that day, adding another 65 cents to the total. <laughs> All right, well, um, I'll just say a word about the Malte Malteser in, in passing. Uh, you should so, sometime go down into the Iowa room and the archives to, s to look at that magazine. It was a very slick magazine. Joe was the business manager, and they got full-page color arrow shirt ads or full-page color general electric ads. Uh, there were about four or five pages of ads at the back of the Malteser. It was so, sold throughout <coughs> Iowa and throughout the Midwest. They, they were be, sort of regarded as the preeminent humor magazine of, of the Midwest. Of the Midwest. And Joe, when Joe talked about his uh, career as a, in publication at the college, he always, first of all, mentioned the Malteser. The Cyclone and the S&B came later. It is, if, if you read Bushman, you always, I can remember hearing from Joe constantly about the Malteser. He was really proud of, of that publication. And clearly, um, it's a slick enough publication that it would not have survived without the ads that Joe was able to get. And of course, he got a few ads from uh, Franco Men's Store and from uh, Harris Emery Department Stores in Des Moines. The family, so he was able to tap his family uh, for ads. Um, and then uh, he really was responsible for producing the 1925 cycle uh, because the editor simply c collapsed. I mean, I don't, it's hard to know. It never says what happened, but the last month or so, two months, he wasn't doing anything. And the, 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 the manuscript, the, the, you know, what, what, what had been done so far, it was just languishing. So Joe took a whole week out to go over to Iowa City with the printer, and they worked. 10, 12 hours a day to get the thing out. So he quite literally saved that particular publication. Now finally, and, and I hope I can do this and leave just a few minutes, a few minutes for your, your questions, are some of the issues, major issues that came up at Grinnell in, in, in Joe's time. And they're all related to this notion of democratic culture. We think of Grinnell College now as in that kind of culture. Uh, it's a dress-down place. I mean, all you have to do is walk around the campus and see the students are not dressed up. Anyone, anyone who buys a wardrobe before a woman, particularly before coming to Grinnell, has made a bad mistake. <laughs> they probably won't wear very many, many days. Um, and certainly in the 20s, there are a lot of issues about cars, and, and the anti-car thing comes actually from mostly from the students, because it separates us. Those who can afford cars, and of course back then, very few people could afford cars, uh, and those who, who could not. Probably the most interesting one was Joe's freshman year, the secret fraternity. There was, it was, it was athletes, 
It was a secret fraternity. It had been going on for several years, and the s and went after it. Uh, it got so bad, and the sports writers were noting this, that the fraternity guys would not block for the non-fraternity guys in football games. I mean, that's bad. I mean, it was cor corrosive. And the s and uh, makes no bones about that. Uh, let's see, uh, I can uh, skip here. This, get, get to, this is, now this is, this is s and satire on the secret fraternity. Uh, it's meeting in, downstairs in a local, under a local business downtown in Grinnell. A sign to hell with the public, Alexander Hamilton, hung over the entrance and a single 15 watt bulb casts its flickering lurid glow upon 18 noble Greeks therein assembled, draped over and upon sugar sacks, cracker boxes, flower barrels, and other sumptuous Panhellenic furniture. <laughs> Mounted on a crate pork and beans, the keeper of the, of the cellar key addresses the brethren saying, these are parlous times and Grinnell democracy is under threat. The glory and greatness of the college depends on us, he says. The brethren grunt hoarsely in our agreement. The Lord guardian of the spirit rises from his divan of table sacks and says, this has went far enough. The brothers chant the first, second, and fourth verses of the latest Greek epic. They plot how to restore the old Grinnell spirit for a bigger, better, more democratic Grinnell. They bewail the loss of student fraternalistic spirit, wondering why perhaps the student body didn't go wilder with the basketball team, or why it should care if a couple of good backfield men were frozen out last fall. Um, but in a more serious vein, an editorial in s &B says, Grinnell today is proud that she is a democratic school. Our ideal is that everyone is on a par with everyone else. But when any group of men and women band together and have to do it secretly, they cannot work against the best interests of the college. It is not in accord with the Grinnell of yesterday, the Grinnell of today, and what we earnestly hope the Grinnell of tomorrow will be. It's a pretty, pretty nice editorial. But uh, they begin to go after President Maine and the administration because they're not doing anything about it. And are they afraid of the fraternity? There was a, there was a fair amount of, there were some local business folks who were supporting the fraternity, and so it was, it was a somewhat contentious thing. Um, but in editorial on May 17th of, of uh, uh, 1923, he challenges President Maine and the administration to do something about the secret fraternity, hinting that the frat men might have the support of the administration. The editor claimed that the public was aware of the fraternity and if the administration did not act, it would be seen as weak and that assessment would be correct. Furthermore, if nothing were done, Grinnell would be in danger of losing students over the issue. The s and accused of bringing bad advertisement to the college and yes, replied the editor, the college fully deserves it. Uh, well, anyway, another, another letter to the editor said, Midwest, Midwest, Midwest smiles when Grinnell claims to have no fraternities. Um, this, is, this comes to a boil in the spring, and so when I was reading the s and I was really anxious to get to the next fall. What's happened? Well, uh, in the next fall, the uh, editorials are about team spirit, and supporting the football team. And President Maine, who typical of Cornell presidents, gives the opening convocation, and his title was, Park Your Grouch Outside. <laughs> <laughs> and in which he says, it doesn't do anybody any good to be negative and critical. We should be positive and forward-looking. So the fraternity issue just disappears totally. And it's pretty clear to me that Maine took the next staff of the s and editors and so on to the woodshed <laughs> over the summer or late in the spring and uh, they quieted it down. So, um, and I'm not sure what would die so easily. It certainly wouldn't have died that easily in the 60s and 70s, but uh, it, it did, did die. So I don't know. Uh, it was secret and uh, how, how much continuation there was, but it ne definitely uh, came to the fore in, in that year. I'm, I'm just going to say, just in passing, and we'll stop, that, that there was a major issue about student government, governance. And 
uh, big, uh, a mantra on ca campus, self-gov, self-gov. Uh, and they tried to enact, to, to carry out self-government of the student, by the students, and they were important campus organizations. But again, Hilda Malk in the s &B said, this is a sham. Because if either the faculty or the administration decide it doesn't like what the self-government of students want or do, they reverse it. So in other words, we are allowed to play in our playpen <laughs> with self-government, but when it comes to really important issues, we have to get approval for the thing that we're pushing. So that was very much alive. But Joe, and, and I guess I really will stop with this, uh, his, his, his concluding, he was interviewed. Uh, and, uh, okay, here it is. And interest, this is really interesting. Joe said, I am not in favor of student government because I do not believe that any group of students elected at large is qualified to pass judgment on serious student misdemeanors. Trained educators should handle the problem of misconduct. Uh, pretty, pretty conservative view for a student to have taken. And interestingly enough, and I'll point this out when we get to it, that Joe was extraordinarily open to uh, the student revolution of the 60s and 70s. He understood it better than most of his fellow trustees. And he kept, he, he was the calming voice on the trustees as this really, I mean, it, I'll, I'll talk about this, but they are overwhelmed. They don't know what's coming. And it just overwhelms them, overwhelms them the, the board and, and the administration. And stuff. Well, I mean, you keep thinking old ways of dealing with students will work, and they don't work. Students don't back off and they don't, and it, it, it takes about three or four years to realize, yeah, this is a revolution, things have changed, we're doing, doing things, operating in a, in a different way. And it was a tough time, the board and administration and faculty, and uh, Joe was a, was a calming voice. You know, students are students, but they're, they're not kids. Anyway, I will stop now, it gives us maybe one minute for questions, I'm sorry, I'll try to be, try to be better next time. Yes? Uh, um, these are the years just before the Depression. Is there anything in any of that that you've read that gave any inkling that they saw what was coming? Well, of course, the, 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 bank, the, the question is, is the Depression is coming uh, in about three more years from Joe's graduation. Uh, certainly with the bank failures. There's some, there some issues and problems, but this is after all the flapper generation, the time and flapper, so not a lot, no, not a lot. Uh, there, and um, the, the student, in, in mock elections, the students were voting Republican. Uh, Coolidge, they were supporting Coolidge. Uh, so it was a reasonably conservative student body. Gene. <coughs> This uh, title uh, of a professorship in applied Christianity uh, interests me. Um, there are dozens and dozens of Christian colleges, but I suspect that's quite unique to Grinnell. What about this? Well, it was, because um, Grinnell was really a leader in the social gospel movement. The, pre the first and previous occupant of the chair was George Herrick in the 1890s, who was now, he and J.B. Grinnell may be the most radical people ever to walk these streets. Um, Heron did not believe in private property. After all, Jesus and the apostles didn't seem to have private property. They were able to make their way, and that there is inherent evil in property. And he went around the nation preaching that. And Gates was under a lot of pressure to fire him. He didn't. It's one of Gates' great, great accomplishments. He protected academic freedom and protected Heron. Now, as we know, Heron let Gates and the college down because he ran off to Europe with the Dean of Women's daughter. <laughs> <laughs> so the chair sat empty until until Steiner uh, occupied it. But yeah, and Gates. This is if you read Joe Wall's history of the Cornell in the 19th century. Gates is his hero. Because, for a variety of reasons, but one of the main reasons is that Gates really did protect academic freedom and was pushing the social gospel. He was a congregational minister, he was a pastor, pastoral background, but he, he was a great president. 
uh, and just exactly what Grinnell needed at that time. But Grinnell was at the forefront of the social gospel movement, which was social action, Christianity as social action. You know? Well, I see we're, we're out of time. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you, George. Thank you all for coming. Remember to turn on your cell phones and turn off your tea coils. And come back next week for the third lecture in George's series. See you then. Thanks.